Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Wayne Fagan. I'm uh, chair of the D. Howard International Education Foundation. Uh, and welcome to uh, this program, which is one in our series of virtual presentations to uh, schools that uh, participate in the D. Howard International Education Foundation Rural STEM Initiative. And uh, we have a host school and we also invite all other schools. And then we record this and, and publish it on our website for the general public to also see. And I'm joined this morning by uh, our partners in this uh, initiative, uh, UTSA, University of Texas, San Antonio, Cleese College of Engineering and Integrated Design. And uh, we have uh, with us from uh, Cleese College, uh, Carlos Velez, uh, Jill Ford, who will make some uh, welcoming remarks on behalf of UTSA Cleese College. And our presenter this morning, our, our, our guest presenter is uh, Professor Danielle Panetta of the UTSA uh, Cleese College. And um, he is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering. And he is going to speak with us today on his topic is linking astronomy and rockets with lasers and fire. Very interesting to hear what he has to say about that. And our special guests, our very, very, very special guests are the students from Carn City High School. Uh, and um, so uh, if, and, and they are our host school for this call. So kids from Carn City, hello to everyone. Can we see you out there? Great. So with that, let me first introduce uh, uh, Jill Ford for some welcoming remarks. And then Jill, if you would uh, turn it over to Carlos who can then introduce uh, uh, Professor Panetta. Wonderful, thank you so much, Wayne. So a big hello from the Clessy College of Engineering and Integrated Design here at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, my name is Jill Ford. I serve as the Assistant Dean for Student Success and just so happy to have this opportunity to participate and be a partner with the D. Howard International Education Foundation on this Rural STEM initiative. And so a big hello and uh, welcome to all of our students at Carn City High School and go Badgers. And with that, I will turn it over to Carlos. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so just some, some formalities for the call. So just kind of general format for this. Um, we will have Dr. Pineda, who will be doing the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we will uh, open it up for questions. So if any of you all have any questions, uh, you can write them down, um, put them in the chat. Or uh, at the end, we'll have you unmute your mics. You can come up to the front um, and ask questions to us directly. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and so for our, our main speaker today, uh, we'll have Dr. Um, Dr. Pineda, who's an assistant professor here at the University of Texas at San Antonio um, within our mechanical engineering department. And so he'll do some introductions. So I'll, I'll leave the introduction uh, short and let him go ahead and jump in and get started. So thank you. All right. Um, so thank you for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I've got uh, some slides here. Um, you know, my title, like, um, you know, we, we mentioned was linking astronomy and rockets with lasers and fire. So I'll go ahead and get right to it. So um, just an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to first just introduce myself, mostly just about me and UTSA. I'm going to talk a little bit about my engineering trajectory. I grew up in Texas and um, have traveled a lot in my education and my training and got to do a lot of cool stuff. And I want to kind of tell you about how you can do that too. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do today. What is spectroscopy? How do we how do we use it? And then some of the stuff that we've been doing here at UTSA that um, that you might be interested in. And then if we've got some time, which I hope that I won't take too long with the other stuff, um, I've got some helpful tips for pursuing engineering careers. So the things that you should, you know, if you're interested in engineering, the stuff that you should be doing in high school right now um, and in the next couple of years to prep um, for that type of career path. 
So, and then that includes so a little bit about the expectations for the first two years, um, you know, of an engineering program, which are historically and for most students, a pretty challenging time. But you know, you can talk. I'm going to talk you through how you can stick with it. So, um, so this is this is me. Um, I'm an assistant professor at UTSA. I started in August 2020, which is you know the greatest year to start a new job. I'm sure many of you probably started high school probably around that time, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, I'm located in San Antonio, Texas. So just up the road in some ways, I research areas include rocket propulsion, laser diagnostics and combustion. So those are all, those are all related. And I'm going to talk about kind of the things, um, that, that are involved there, but I'll talk a little bit about the university of Texas at San Antonio. Um, we're a public research university. We've um, been steadily increasing our research expenditures since I, since I started here, that means that we do a lot of research activity. We, you know, we do a lot of cool experiments. We um, and we train a lot of students in um, the engineering skills um, that they need to compete in the workforce. Uh, we've got a new science and engineering building that opened up when I started. Student maker space uh, that includes plastic and metal additive manufacturing. So we have metal three D printers, and I'll talk about how I use that in my research in a bit. We have a student machine and welding shop, um, and I, I like that we let our students use a lot of this stuff themselves, um, which is atypical from the institutions that I've been to. And then since about 2018, we've had a pretty focused investment in aerospace, which includes new faculty such as myself, some new degree plans and some new courses, some of which I teach. So let's talk, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, I don't normally uh, enjoy talking about myself because I don't like being the center of attention, but um, I think it's important to, you know, put myself in your shoes and recognize where um, where you might be coming from. So I was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1989, so not, not too long ago, but I tried to create my own first rocket with about like 12 little bang snap firecrackers and an empty water bottle. I didn't really understand how the physics worked. I was five, but I, I had, I had the idea that I wanted to, you know, that I wanted to build something that could, that could get, you know, that could go up into space or at least up to the roof of the house. Um, I attended Texas public schools, um, you know, in the 90s, and there was a summer program at UTSA that I actually attended when I was about 15 um, called PREP, Pre-Freshman Engineering Program. Uh, and then I started playing around with fireworks a lot more when I was like in high school around your age, probably 16, 17. I started, I started doing a lot of stuff that probably that, you know, I didn't tell my parents about exactly, but it, it, it spurred my interest in engineering. And I eventually, you know, I went to UT Austin got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, and those are my parents there. After that, I decided to attend graduate school um, where I went to UC Berkeley. I went to California. I got my master's and my PhD. My parents um, have been there every step of the way with my education, and so I'm very thankful for them. Uh, then after that, I went to UCLA as a postdoctoral appointee, which is kind of like a fancy term for, you know, I, I, I had, you could call me doctor, but I wasn't a professor just yet. Um, and that's where I got to work on a lot of rocket um, rocket engineering projects that, that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And then since about 2020, I've been a professor at UTSA and I've been training students um, in, in you know, aerospace related skills and rockets. So, um, so not too long ago, I was where you are right now. Um, I was in high school and while I was in high school, I was taking accelerated math classes. I looked up the curriculum that you all have um, at Kern City High School. And I see that it is an option for a lot of you in 11th and 12th grade to take some advanced math classes. So that was me. I was taking advanced math classes. Um, and as I mentioned, I attended prep at UTSA because I knew that I wanted to be an engineer. I didn't really know what kind of engineer I wanted to be. Um, in high school, I was I, I was a pretty strong high school student. I, follow, I was really good at following the rules. Uh, and that being said, I still procrastinated a lot, but I still was able to complete a lot of assignments. What I mean to say, and what I mean to set up here is that a lot of things naturally came somewhat easy to me, and that changed when I went to college, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. I took almost every math pl math class that I possibly could um, while, I, while I was there, and that did help me a lot um, later on. But I wasn't I wasn't completely, you know, totally invested in math and science. I took art all four years of high school. I painted a lot. I still do oil painting in my spare time. I also took debate, which I where I learned how to do public speaking and other, you know, other electives like that. 
So, um, so yeah, so I was a well-rounded student. And um, when I was uh, in the last two years of high school, I was prepping for college. And that was an important part of, you know, my, my trajectory. Um, I was fortunate enough to visit a few colleges the summer after junior year. Um, the PSAT and the National Merit Qualifying Exam was pretty important for scholarships at UT Austin's Engineering School. Um, I took this the SAT and the ACT, and I prepared for those with like a lot of practice tests. Um, and the best preparation that I actually encountered was dual credit and advanced classes. So um, with all of that, I was eventually accepted at UT Austin um, in the mechanical engineering program. And the first few years were were somewhat difficult. Um, you know, I felt like I didn't really know what I was doing because, you know, the first semester was a pretty tough time. I struggled in my physics classes. Um, I often felt uh, like, you know, even though the calculus classes were a little bit easier because I had taken calculus in high school, it was still it was still a lot of a struggle. And there were a lot of questions of like, you know, do I belong here in engineering? Am I supposed to be here in engineering? Um, and that's what we call imposter syndrome. Because essentially high school was very easy for me, but like when I went to college the first four years, I encountered, you know, I, I encountered something completely different and I hadn't been, you know, my, my ego hadn't necessarily been prepared for that type of, that type of challenge. But I eventually buckled down um, and I started to study with other engineering students um, in my dorm instead of alone. And um, that really helped out uh, a lot. I was able to study for exams and, you know, get input from other students in ways that, you know, I hadn't been thinking about uh, problems um, for, for a lot of the homework assignments and the exams. And that, that helped me a lot. So the uh, second two years of college, um, you know, started to feel a little bit more um, I felt more comfortable in my classes, the classes like thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and heat transfer. I did feel, um, you know, I was, I wasn't just doing math and I wasn't just doing physics that felt very disconnected from, from real engineering problems. I was taking engineering classes and that helped me, you know, really get adjusted and, and feel, um, you know, I was able to solve some of those problems and I felt like I was actually, you know, an engineer. So, and, you know, just as for some context, thermodynamics is the study of energy transformations. And it is a topic that I had, that I had been introduced to in high school, but didn't really, um, you know, didn't really appreciate it until I took it in college. Um, I learned of a research lab opening when I went to office hours, started doing combustion experiments. Um, I had a really great mentor who encouraged me to go to graduate school um, during that time. And I also read a lot of Carl Sagan. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Carl Sagan was an astronomer. Um, he was an astronomer who cared uh, very deeply about education of the American public um, and this, and you know America's place in space and humanity's place in the cosmos. So um, that got me thinking about the big picture, and I started, you know, at the last two years of college, I was I was ready to uh, ready to tackle some more things. So. Um, so yeah, so after college, um, I attended, uh, you know, I applied to a lot of different graduate schools. I was accepted, um, at MIT, Cornell, Michigan, UT Austin, Georgia Tech, UC Berkeley. Ultimately, I ended up choosing UC Berkeley because I was going to be there for five years. And, um, a lot of those other places got pretty cold and I wanted something different. I wanted something a little bit different than what I'd had than what I'd had before. Um, but again, I felt like I didn't belong. Like I felt like um, I was surrounded by a bunch of really smart people, and 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 but it, and it took me a little bit of time to work past that. But I was able, but I was able to do um, just fine. So while I was there, um, I studied automotive combustion engines. I was always interested in cars and automobiles um, while I was growing up. I studied specifically advanced ignition techniques, and I wasn't even really thinking about rockets or lasers. Um, and during that time, I traveled the world during uh, during my graduate studies. But I started to question, you know, what what am I going to do after, you know, after the after the PhD? So I, I understand that there was like a classroom change just now. So um, I am just going through uh, my my education trajectory uh, just so that I can put that put this into the context of where where all of you are right now. So, um, so yeah, so I'd gone to school and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, even though I kept going to school. And so I ended up getting recruited to the University of California, Los Angeles as a postdoc. 
I was partially funded by a California-based National Science Foundation fellowship. And I got to, under this fellowship, study flame chemistry using advanced laser diagnostics. So there's a picture of me um, working on aligning a laser beam um, in, in a flame here that, you know, we're looking at basically trying to take a measurement of what the temperature is inside of the flame without using a thermometer um, so that we can get a picture of it. I was also funded partially by a philanthropist who was really invested in student rocket clubs. So as part of my appointment, I was mentoring the UCLA rocket club to design, build and launch liquid, liquid propellant rockets, which hadn't really be, been done at the collegiate level um, very extensively before, but now a lot of colleges are doing it and we were one of the first, which was very exciting. So there I am with some students after a successful hot fire, and then there's one of the rockets that's 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 going up. So after that, I came back to San Antonio. I accepted an assistant professor position at UTSA Mechanical Engineering in 2020, um, which of course, you know, as I mentioned before, not the greatest year to start a new job, but um, I I decided to take online teaching incredibly seriously. I uh, developed um, you know this this lightboard system that I could use to teach classes online on Zoom. Um, I teach now rocket propulsion, fluid mechanics, and gas dynamics, and now I'm currently building up at UTSA the laser spectroscopy and chemical propulsion laboratory, which I'm which I'm now going to talk about um, a little bit. So, in terms of what I do today, um, there's rockets and propulsion research at UTSA, and I, uh, you know, I'm primarily interested in spectroscopy. So, like, what is it? What is spectroscopy? So, spectroscopy, I like to tell people, is the interaction of light and matter. You can still get sunburn on a cloudy day because water vapor doesn't necessarily absorb in the UV, right? UV is what gives you the sunburn and clouds absorb the mid infrared. They, it, it feels cooler under a cloud, but it lets the UV light pass right through and give you a sunburn. So different molecules absorb light at different wavelengths. And we call this a behavior atomic and molecular spectra. They're like fingerprints. Um, and so what the sun puts down to earth looks very different from what the earth puts down, you know, puts back out into space. And all of the gases that are inside of, you know, the earth's atmosphere help regulate earth's temperature. They absorb some of that light, the oxygen and ozone will absorb some of the UV that helps us out a lot. Water vapor can help keep us cool. Um, but at night, it can also help keep us warm, right? If you're close to the ocean, you know, the temperature doesn't change as much because of all the water in the air, that kind of thing. There's also applications to planetary science, such as the James Webb Space Telescope, which has recently launched, and I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, all of this behavior of gases interacting with light really depends on like what the gas is, its structure, the temperature, the pressure, and how much of that gas is there. So we, you may be familiar with fireworks, right? And so this is a primary example of like how light can interact with matter. Uh, the sodium, the barium, the strontium, copper, titanium, we all put those into fireworks because when they burn at really high temperatures, they generate certain wavelengths of light. So this is an example of light interacting with matter. And with astronomy, right, because I was interested in space when I was when I was a kid and as and I continued being interested in space in college, um, cameras that look at different wavelengths can look at different gases, right? So if we look at this pillars of creation, which is like a, a, a structure that's out there in space, I'm sure you've seen this image before. If you look at it at different wavelengths, whether it's the visible wavelength that you and I can see, or whether it's the near infrared that you and I cannot see, but your phone might be able to see a little bit, or the mid infrared, which we can't see with most of the instruments that we know, it all looks different. and some of it allows us to look through dust and gas. Um, some gases become invisible at some wavelengths and others that were previously we didn't know were there, it turns out um, are there. So it's a pretty exciting time to be invested in spectroscopy because we're discovering things that we could never see before and that's really exciting. Um, so what's an engineer doing with, doing with spectroscopy, doing with all this stuff that's related to astronomy? Well, I like to make measurements. Measurements are really critical parts of science and propulsion and energy systems of the future are gonna operate beyond the current limits of physical understanding. And in like, you know, turbojets, um, in these rocket engines, there's a lot of competing physics involved, right? In high school, you take a chemistry class, you take a physics class um, and they're different classes sometimes, but um, you know, in real applications of like engines, like they're all interacting with one another. 
And so modeling that is really difficult because it involves a lot of different branches of physics. Uh, that And if we can't model it, it makes it difficult for us to make a design, right? If you don't know how strong you need a container to be to hold a reaction, then you can't build an engine that operates on that reaction. So we need, in order to better understand the physics, we need really sensitive measurements. We need measurements that are quantitative, that give us like something that we can compare to a model, like a temperature. Um, and we need to be able to make these in extreme environments. And so I've got a little image here of a flame, like a turbulent flame you might see in a Bunsen burner, like in a chemistry lab. And then there's on the left, like a model that, you know, a physicist came up with to try to simulate a flame. We want to use the models to be able to predict flame behavior so we can design engines that run on combustion. But we also need experiments to anchor those models, right? Our models are only good as what they can reproduce and what they can predict. So we need to make measurements in the laboratory to have better confidence in, in the models. And so that's where I that's where spectroscopy comes in, um, and specifically the lasers that I work with. We, you know, in the mid-infrared that we're not able to see with our very own eyes, uh, there's a lot of strong absorption bands of like a lot of gases that are related to combustion, right? Combustion makes CO2, it makes water. Um, sometimes we burn methane. Those are all very strongly absorbing in wavelengths that we can't see. And in order to make measurements, uh, we need to be able to access those wavelengths. And to do that, we look at mid-infrared lasers to, to help us make those measurements. Um, also, I have here plotted some molecules that are relevant to health and the environment, things like pollutants, right? Things that generate acid rain, um, acids that might not be that great to breathe, ammonia that might be of biological significance. Um, but we can make measurements of these gases with the lasers that I'm able to that I'm able to build up in my lab. And so I've got some examples here with little coins on them, just so you can see just how small they are. Um, and that's pretty exciting. So here's some example measurements that I helped make back, back when I was at UCLA um, of, a, of a methane flame pair. Uh, so I got two Bunsen burners, basically, and I stuck them together. And using both lasers and mid-infrared cameras, I was able to make some images of, of methane for the two flames. So even though it looks to us like they're merged together, the methane part of the flame is actually really far apart. Um, and so it's really exciting to be able to see what we couldn't see before by making these measurements. Before, before combustion products become CO2, they go to an intermediate step of carbon monoxide. So we were able to record that as well. And we were all, also able to make measurements of like a temperature. And so what we see with these flames is that the core of the Bunsen burner is actually quite cold, right? The flame hasn't reacted yet, but the outside of the flame is actually the part that's that's really hot. And so it's cool to be able to make to make these measurements using using the lasers in in the laboratory. So I started in August 2020, and it's and and it's been a build up process. Uh, so we've got some equipment and facilities here that I want to talk about. That's here at UTSA. It's really exciting to be able to use these to make measurements. Um, in my laboratory, I have a lot of high purity gas handling infrastructure. I've got some mixing tanks, vacuum pumps, a toxic gas cabinet so that I can handle toxic gases, a lot of different pressure and flow regulators. Um, we're building a high enthalpy shock tube that's coming in fall 2023. Um, this is a model of it, but just yesterday, actually, I got news that it, it passed a pressure test of uh, 380 atmospheres. We designed it to hit up to 280 very safely, but we are able to go to 100 atmospheres above that, and that's really exciting. That and that means we're going to be able to recreate a, an you know an environment that's very similar to a rocket engine inside of this, because I think SpaceX's Raptor engine just hit like 360 atmospheres or something like that. So we can totally recreate that in the laboratory, even if it's just for a short amount of time. And here's a photograph of it being um, pressure tested. The photograph is not really very exciting because when you're pressure testing something, you're really hoping that it doesn't explode. And I'm really glad it didn't because it was a really big, you know, it's a really big investment. So the other research that we do at UTSA, we've got a turbulent jet burner similar to the one that I've made measurements on before. Um, it when we you can make a flat flame, it's really exciting. So this is like a, an advanced Bunsen burner. Uh, I would I would talk about it that way. And then we've got um, a propulsion test stand where we can build and test rocket engines here at UTSA. We have a metal 3D printer. And here's an example image on the on the right here of something that we printed out. 
Um, and that was a, that was a metal 3D printed rocket engine that one of my students here at UTSA designed, manufactured, and tested all you know on on his own, with some help from everybody in the lab, of course. So I've got some other research projects that are not necessarily related to rockets, some that are. Um, I have a project from the National Science Foundation about using ammonia for carbon-free energy and propulsion. Um, I've got a project that uses generative or artificial intelligence design for basically keeping rocket engines cold. And this is for a special type of rocket engine called a rotating detonation rocket engine. Um, that's gonna be the next frontier in propulsion research. I've also got some projects related to, you know, understanding how propellants burn, so advanced propellants for rocket engines. I've also got a project looking at portable toxic gas sensors for first responders uh, through FEMA, right? When plastics burn, they make a lot of nasty gases, and we're finding that firefighters exposed to those gases have chronic health issues, so we want to make sure that they're safe in an environment like that. And I've also got a project that's uh, working on sensor development for propellant production on Mars. So turning the CO2 in the Martian atmosphere into methane fuel so that we can um, so that we can fuel rockets, not just to go to Mars, but to go from Mars to other places in the solar system. So because I work in spectroscopy, I get to work in this neat intersection of science and engineering, right? Uh, when I was in high school, I was I struggled with what I wanted to do because I was really interested in fundamental science, especially like later in college I was, but engineering proved to be like a pretty fruitful um, endeavor, right? There's a lot of demand for engineers in the workforce. You get to build stuff, not just study things. And so I, I always had that inclination, but working in sensors allows me to do both, right? In engineering, you have things like mechanical design, you manufacture things, um, you know, you have to look, think about how efficient things are. In science, you're you're not necessarily interested with how efficient something is. You just want to understand the physics or our place in the universe. And so sensors operate at that intersection, and it's and it really increases uh, student opportunities for employment in post graduation. One of my students who just graduated um, just accepted an offer to work at Relativity Space um, to you know design and build 3D printed rocket engines, and so that's it's really exciting for us. The other things that I do at UTSA is that um, I have a, you know, I mentor the undergraduate rocket club um, and, you know, aerospace industry is constantly looking for graduates with practical engineering experience. They don't want someone who's just looked at stuff uh, in classes, right? It, coursework is, is, is half of the battle. You need to practice being an engineer. And it's not just about the math and the science. And it's also about how do you manage people, right? When you're managing a project, you're like a boss and that requires having to figure out, well, if we make this part by this week, is it going to be ready so that we can put the system together by the next week? That kind of stuff. Um, and then we have to give ourselves time to test it. What happens if we build something and it doesn't work? Do we still have enough time to try again? Um, you know, sometimes you need to ask for help with design reviews, like asking, you know, someone who's already an engineer, hey, can you look over this design and make sure that it's okay? So yeah, as I mentioned, I'm the current faculty advisor for UTSA Student Rocket Club. Um, I was also an advisor at UCLA, and so I've got the photo there of the hot fire. But pretty much by being involved in the student organization, I can help the students accomplish more because, you know, while still being safe, because I've got some experience. And it's also been a promising pool for undergraduate and graduate level research opportunities because students who are interested in rockets some of them get interested in rocket research, and that's an area where there's a lot of cool stuff going on as well. Um, and so something that you may be interested in as high school students that I'll talk about right now is that if you're interested in engineering, there's a lot of things you can be doing right now to help, you know, to help you get there. Um, and so, you know, I want to be very clear that engineering can be both a challenging and really rewarding major. Um, you know, you may be encouraged to be, you know, to, to study engineering because your parents might be asking you to do that or encouraging you to do that, or you're just interested in building stuff. But either way, it's it usually requires a lot more credit hours than a lot of other majors um, at college or university. And the prerequisite math and science classes can be pretty brutal. Um, a lot of times there's huge classes, which I'll talk about in a second. And it's not like the experience you have now where there's about like one teacher to every 20 students. In this case, there's like one teacher to like 200 students. 
And so you don't get as much access to the instructor and a lot of it is self-motivated. But if you're good at solving problems and you like solving problems, you're gonna be a good engineer. Because after you get an engineering degree, you can pretty much do anything that you want. Um, and I wanna be clear that sometimes getting things wrong is the fastest way to learn something. Like if I got a hundred on a test, like I didn't think about that stuff again. But if I failed a test, I was very, I remember what I got wrong on the test. And I also want to emphasize that not everything is learned in the classroom, right? You want to you want to be able to work on a project that give, and build something that gives you experience that way. So, you know, you might be asking, what should I be doing right now? You know, and the engineering path really starts like in middle school and in high school. So, you know, there's a challenge and an opportunity associated with with engineering. One, degrees require a lot of credit hours and a lot of math skills. So you should take calculus if you can in, in, in high school. I highly recommend it. You might be, you know, I understand that senior year is a time to relax a little bit, but, um, you know, take that calculus class because it's really going to make calculus easier in college if you want to go that route. Um, you know, and then sometimes universities can be expensive. Sometimes they're far away from home. Um, if you take the SAT, the PSAT or the ACT seriously, there's a lot of merit-based scholarships that are associated with those. Um, the other challenge that you might be facing right now is that you're not sure exactly what you want to do, and that's totally fine. And it might seem like there's too many options. But if you choose a broad engineering discipline like mechanical engineering, like it's a very it's a very broad field. There's biomedical applications, there's research, there's energy, there's oil and gas, there's HVAC, all kinds of things you can do with a mechanical engineering. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I do think that it's a good opportunity if you don't know what you're what you want to do to choose that path. Um, and so the first two years in college, um, there it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be a little bit rough. There's going to be large prerequisite classes, not a whole lot of instructor interaction. I encourage you to, de to develop study groups. You know, you might, if you're the kind of person who works fine on your own, like I was when I was in high school, you might encounter that that doesn't that that doesn't work very well for you in college, just like I did. You know, I struggled my first year of college. Um, and so all of the engineering majors, like chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, they all take the same math and science classes at the very first part of college. So you can develop study groups with, with all those people, even people who are not in your major. I recommend that you live on campus if possible, because it can minimize distractions and other, other engineering students living in your dorm. Uh, you can study with them and uh, you can become lifelong friends with them. And that's what's happened to me. Take advantage of the resources that are available to you. Office hours are opportunities. They're, they're dedicated time that instructors have for, for students to ask questions about the homework, about upcoming exams. Uh, definitely utilize those when you can. And then the other thing that I will say is to be honest about yourself, about time management. Sometimes, you know, you and some of it comes with youth. You can do a lot. You can do sports. You can do advanced math. You can do um, you know, honor society activities, you can volunteer for a lot of stuff. And um, when you get to a college level classes, you have a lot of free time. Right now you start at like, you know, eight something in the morning and you end at four something in the afternoon and every hour of your day is basically scheduled. In college, that kind of goes away. There's classes, but you decide what you want to do with your time. And so you have to use that wisely um, and study or even, you know, take the time to go relax or go to a sports game or something, because that's also important. Some helpful tips. Um, engineering is a four-year degree. Not all colleges have engineering programs. Some students want to, you know, they to opt to take uh, their math classes and their physics classes at community colleges to get them out of the way. That's a great opportunity because it gives you more direct interaction with an instructor. Some students are more successful in smaller classes, especially if that's what you're used to. Um, and so starting at community college and transferring to a four-year university later can sometimes be financially easier because the tuition's usually lower. Sometimes it's even free. Uh, and the schedules are usually more flexible, especially if you're working outside of school um, to make some money on the side or to support your rent or your family. The last thing that I'll talk about here is uh, when you if, you, if you choose to go to college and to do engineering, I highly recommend you join a club right? Join the rocket club, join the racing club, join, you know, the solar car club, all kinds of stuff like that. Because one, it's a great way to meet new friends. And the other, and the other, it's a great way to meet people who have common interest. And it also 
helps you practice being an engineer. Sometimes it's really difficult to see the real world application of what you're doing, especially if you don't get the chance to use your hands and build something. But by joining a club the first couple of years of college, you can put something together. And these are all photos that I took of students who are in engineering clubs. Like I took them myself and they're all having a great time building rockets. So, so I highly encourage that. Um, the engineering path is difficult, but it is rewarding. So, um, so yeah, so I've got um, a lot of time for questions, if anyone has them. I know that I went on for a bit and that there was a class change somewhat before, but we have a lot of time. So if something's not clear, I would totally welcome any questions um, in the chat or otherwise. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. Dr. Um, Dr. Oh, yeah, go for it. Jump right in. Dr. Freneda, first of all, thank you at UTSA for hosting this. I have both my advanced aviation class and our math class in with us today for this presentation. So I know you can't see everybody, but we've got about 30 students in the class. Hmm. I'm going to ask the first question. Yeah, I teach all physics right. and aviation. A lot of kids ask, what is a laser and how is it made? Can you can you explain that at you know at our high school level? Sure. Yeah. So I so there there are different types of lasers and they work in different ways. The most accessible idea that I can think of is if you have an LED an LED light, uh, it's called like a light emitting diode. That that is pretty close to what a, a laser is, like the type that I work on in my lab. And, th and those are everywhere, right? You even have LED like computer screens, you have LED um, light bulbs. The functional difference between those light bulbs and other types of light bulbs is that when you pass a current through them, there's some threshold, right? There, you, if you, you know, there, there's some, you can put one volt in uh, for, for voltage and it doesn't light up. But if you put 1.7 volts in, the light will light up. So the lasers work in the same way. It emits light at a certain wavelength when you put a current through it. And so the LEDs that you are experienced with either on the switchboards in your car um, or even just the ones on your remote control, the, the only difference really is that like you just can't see the wavelengths that I work with. Um, the other difference is that uh, for a laser, that light is collimated into a single beam, right? An LED light, you let the light go everywhere, but for a laser, the light is just all in one direction and all in one wavelength. So an LED is probably the closest thing that's most accessible that you could use to understand how a laser works. Um, and I'll, I'll also say for the wavelengths that you can't see, like, if you take like a remote control for a TV and you point it at your phone, you can see a little light turn on um, on the phone, but you can't see it with your eyes. And that's because it's coming out at a wavelength that you can't see, but your phone can see it. So I recommend trying that at home for some of that experience. Hmm. So what, like a little red light will call on the phone or like, like on the screen of the phone? It won't look red. No, It'll no. look just like a, like a bright light, but you can't <laughs> see the bright light with your eyes. Yeah. I never, I, I'm absolutely going to try to run and get home. Um, yeah, any other questions from the class? We're teaching. I got one. I, I think the students, they're they are trying to figure out which student's going to ask this question, okay? <laughs> what if you come up and ask? Don't be shy. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's nice Just, when the students ask. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, anything, anything's game here. <laughs> they pass it among four students. <laughs> Okay, I don't like being the center of attention, but we'll get used to it. <laughs> All right. Finally, finally got a volunteer. They, they're, they're in, they want to ask this question, but then they want to pass it among the kids. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> what was your favorite math class and why? So I think my favorite math class um, was probably calculus. I think that that because the because everything kind of builds on 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 the first on the first few weeks of class. Like if you take geometry um, and algebra, sometimes things seem disconnected, right? You learn about like finding the roots of an equation, or you learn about like different theorems. 
and they seem a little bit disconnected but in calculus like there's there's a it's very layered like what you learn the first week like helps you learn the second week helps you learn the third week and i liked that structure that's probably why i'm an engineer i would say the most useful class is probably statistics that i took and my least favorite class was trigonometry because I'm, I'm not i don't i don't like the sines and the cosine but it's okay. I still I still managed to be an engineer. So even if you don't like a particular math class, it's it's fine. What about your favorite like engineering or science class? Like, mm, so I would say that my favorite science class was was AP Biology. Even though I don't I don't use it today because that was a dual credit class that I took um, also, um, and I I liked learning a, like I had a really great teacher. And when you have a really great teacher, even if you, even if I like, even though I haven't used biology in like a really long time, like I had a great, I had a great time in that class because I feel like I learned a lot and I feel like I appreciated, you know, how, how life works on earth. Other questions from the class? One more. <laughs> um, we have a robotics class here and I teach it and we have, of course, the electronics part. We have the design part backed up with 3D printing and so. What is your recommendation? Where should we put our biggest effort in that robotics class? So I would, in in terms of, in terms of uh, putting an effort into, I think a class that's going to prepare students um, to build projects. I think that, you know, having something that's integrated. So let me let me try to rephrase this question. You talked about, you know, a couple of different subjects. You talk about, you know, electronics and circuits and robotics, which involves using those to move things. And then you talked about 3D printing. So having a project that combines all of those all of those topics would be very beneficial because it's one thing to work on something on your own, but in the engineering workforce, you are often not working alone. You are working on a team and different members of the team have different responsibilities. So um, being having some people responsible for maybe the circuits or some people responsible for 3D printing and then having to put it together is a good way to practice being an engineer. Um, because what might happen is that something might not fit together and that's a learning experience that's 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 really that's really important and it's better to learn that now than later um because it also teaches students how to manage the expectations of other people not just the technical stuff but also how is this other person going to, to communicate so that we can fit these two parts together right thank you Any other I know that not the everyone's class? a big fan of group yeah. projects, but like <laughs> life is group projects, I, 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 and and you have to learn to 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 work with them. Any other questions? One, one last shot for any questions they have, and they're they're telling me they have no more. <laughs> yeah, and it can be about anything. I mean, it can be about it can be about either my experience or what college um, engineering is like, or um, or just why I chose to do something. Well, I think those you questions said your, are always. <laughs> you said your favorite like high school classes, but what about like your ones at university level? So the, my favorite class that I took ever in my life was an astronomy class for non-science majors. <laughs> like I, I it did not count towards my degree plan, but I had the time to take it. And so I took this astronomy class and I wasn't worried about keeping up with the math because it was for non-science majors. And I, this was like my third year of college. So I was pretty comfortable with it. And I just got to appreciate space and the universe. How is it that we know what stars are made of really far away? You know, how, how is it that we know how far away they are to begin with? Those types of questions are spectroscopy questions. And I thought that it was so fascinating that we could like build a space probe that we could send out 
to take pictures of different planets um, because that's that's us building things to learn more about where we are in the universe and that was a really cool thing for me um, not required for my degree you know not and but just something that i wanted that, that i wanted to do it, it's ironic that you say that but we are uh, i teach physics uh at this high school and from thanksgiving to christmas we actually stop physics and we teach astronomy I, I, well just like you i felt like students they they don't understand you know the cosmos and above and it's interesting and i think they find that a great break for for the class for physics we just the, the sky is clear in the in a winter time months and we get out and look at the constellations and their assignments each night would be you know to look at a star or look at something and come back and talk about it so thank you for sharing that as well yeah did anyone here catch the annular eclipse this past weekend raise your hand if you saw saw the eclipse yeah all right i mean that that was pretty cool right I mean that's that's uh that's that's a thing that happened that doesn't happen very often um and it just kind of reminds us where we are in space and i think that that's that that's important i have a telescope in my office i mean that's that's how much i'm still into this stuff so uh doctor i guess i'm gonna throw out just one quick question so if somebody's like interest like maybe has like a loose interest in rockets and they're like you know what like that stuff sounds cool but i mm -hmm. don't i wouldn't know how to get involved in you know rocketry yet either where i'm at now or in the future um, yeah so would you recommend so, people like kind of start getting into this stuff so i encourage students one to um reach out to me if they have a specific question that i mean that's why i put my email address out here and I'm, i mean i'm happy obviously like you know professors are pretty busy but like i i usually take you know i'm able to take the time to respond to students who are interested in rockets and engineering but for rockets specifically, I would recommend buying a kit like at a local hobby store. Um, and you, you, you know, that, that, that stuff, there's certain requirements you have to launch, you know, pretty far away from buildings and things like that. But it's very accessible. Like a lot of hobby stores have like a model rocket kit with a launch rail and like a couple of motors to get you started. And just going from there, um, you know, following the directions, that's, that's a good place to get started if you're interested and you haven't already done that. Um, building a model plane, um, an RC plane is another thing that, that, that a lot of students do. That's a lot of their paths to this, to this type of thing, because it requires patience and putting stuff together and then making sure things work. So yeah, that's all, that's all part of it. And I recommend that if you have questions about how to do it after high school, that you contact me here at UTSA. Even if you don't want to go to UTSA, that's that's fine. I'm from Texas, so I want to help students in Texas and elsewhere, of course. But my heart is here. Cool. Um, and I think they muted. <laughs> I think I think we're probably wrapped up on questions. Um, and All with right. that, um, uh, I can pass it back over to Wayne. Would you like to say anything for closing out uh, for the session today, Wayne? Yeah, thank you, Carlos. And and thanks to everyone. And thanks to the students for the questions and for Mr. Purser for organizing uh, the class uh, to uh, participate in this program. Uh, I have a uh, <clears throat> question for uh, Dr. Pineda. Uh, I was, as, as you were presenting, uh, I talk to uh, a lot of uh, scientists in the rocket field. Uh, we collaborate with uh, Virgin Galactic, for example. We collaborate with uh, Blue Origin, and we collaborate with um, um, an entity called the Aerospace Corporation, among others. Uh, that mm -hmm does an awful lot in rockets. And uh, so I hear a lot about it. And when I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking about a discussion that I often have with those people is, is how you, um, how do you get the rocket? You know, how do you create an engine uh, so that you can have enough fuel of whatever makes the engine go to get you to a distant light to Mars and down to the Mars surface and back to back to uh, to Earth. 
Uh, does any of the research that you are doing uh, uh, advance the ball in terms of uh, propulsion, in terms of um, uh, these rockets? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. So I have a couple of projects on an emerging technology called a rotating detonation engine. And it is theoretically and has been, sh you know, this past year been shown to be uh, more efficient in its propellant usage than, than in traditional rocket engines. The main difference being is that it's a controlled detonation process, which is, which, um, which I guess for this audience, it makes the most sense to call it, you know, it's more efficient it, it, and it, and it doesn't, it doesn't create as much entropy, which is, which is a, you know, the, the, the dearth of efficiency. And so, and with, and so like one of the things that we, you know, was theoretically predicted to be maybe 20% uh, more efficient uh, just in the thermodynamic cycle, but because of the way rockets work, right. You need to carry the fuel with you. Right. And, a 20% efficiency boost in an engine can give you, can help, can double your payload. Like the, 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 the benefits are, ma are even more magnified for rockets because not only are you carrying less fuel, you can carry more of what you want to take into space to begin with. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I was one of the, I, I was a part of the group of the first people to make a laser absorption measurement in a rotating detonation engine in the mid infrared. Uh, that was, you know, and um, I was also one of the first people to use um, what's called hypergolic propellants to detonate um, in a rotating detonation engine architecture. Those are useful because you don't need an igniter. Uh, they just ignite when they touch each other, which is which is scary, but useful. And so, so yeah, so a lot of the research that I do work on is directly related to advancing our place in space and our planetary exploration, not just for humans, but also for spacecraft. Thank you for that. Um, well, with that, uh, I just once again want to thank Dr. Panetta, uh, Carn City High School, uh, UTSA Cleese College of Engineering and Integrated Design for their participation and support. And stay tuned for our next presentation, which will be in uh, a few weeks. So thank you all. And uh, Carlos, we'll wrap it up here. All right. Thank you all. Bye.